Hello and welcome to Program It Yourself in Java. My name is Chris, and in this episode, we will be talking about arrays. While we won't be needing this concept in the immediate future, I don't really have a better place to fit this in. Because after I'm done teaching you this, I will be finishing up the basic tutorials with one large dedicated project. Now don't get me wrong, there's still a lot to learn. But if everything works out the way I think, we can apply the knowledge we've gained so far and the knowledge we will gain in the future, right to that project and make it grow. But for now, let's talk about arrays. Arrays are a really useful concept when we're dealing with large quantities of data. So far, we've been working with three variables at most, but in larger and in more sophisticated programs, it is not rare to process hundreds or even thousands of variables. If we used our traditional way of creating variables and assigning values, we would sit there for quite a while. Not to mention, managing them all would be downright hell. Imagine you're working on a number crunching program and you have to work with a hundred variables. With the knowledge we have so far, it would look something like this. I think the problem has become clear. Arrays provide a nice solution to this. Instead of declaring and initializing a hundred different variables, we could do just this. What we did just now was creating an array of a hundred integer variables. Let's look at this step by step. Like with a normal variable, we first need to declare its type, in this case, an integer. We then follow this type with an opened and closed square bracket. And then as always, we give it a name. Here my array. And like we did before with variables, we can assign a value to this. We need to use the new keyword, followed again by the data type, and defining how many variables of that type we want to store in the array, again in squared brackets. I will hold off the new keyword for now. We will encounter it again when we are dealing with classes. Suffice to say for now that it allocates memory for our variables in a specific way, and we need to do that when we want to use arrays in this manner. In the first part right here, you are also free to choose where you want to place your square brackets. You can either place it after the data type, or you can place it after specifying the name. Both work just the same. You can also declare your array first and initialize it later. Keep in mind though that when you've decided on a size for your array, you won't be able to change it later. Now let's change the size of our array and see what we can do. Right now we have an array that holds five integer variables. Right, before I forget to mention it, arrays can only hold data of one specific type. So right now we've got an array of integers. We wouldn't be able to place any strings or doubles in there. Now all of our five integers are not initialized. We haven't assigned a value to them yet. Luckily Java is very lenient with this and initializes variables automatically with the value zero. Other programming languages aren't that friendly, so keep in mind that this is a luxury in Java. There are a few ways that we can access these five variables and assign values to them. The most direct one would be an array initializer list. When using an initializer list, we don't specify the size of the array within the square brackets. The size gets defined by the amount of values that we enter. Here's how it looks. The initializer list begins with an open curly brace and is followed by the values that you input. Then it is finished with a closed curly brace. So as you can see here, I've entered five different values. This means that our array has a size 5 and the elements in that array, our integers, have the following values. The first integer has the value 10, the second has the value 14, and so on and so forth. I haven't seen this being used much in user code, but it's certainly an option. It also gives me an easy way of showing you how accessing of an element of the array works. Let's say we want to take the second element of our array and print out its value. So we want this value right here. 
14. We would do it like this. When we want to access a specific element of the array, we can call its respective index. So right here I typed in the name of the array, my array, and again in squared brackets, I put in the index that I want to access. In this case, 2. So if we go ahead and run this, we should get the value 14. Well, you should probably know by now that when I say we should get this value, there's gonna be something wrong. So where's the mistake? We specified that we wanted the second element of our array, right here, but instead we got the third element, 16. So why is that? Luckily, the answer is actually pretty simple. In most computer programming languages, we don't start counting at 1. We start counting at 0. So if we wanted to access the first element of our array, 10, we would have to type in 0 as our index. Let me go ahead and run this. And we get our 10. So even though we've got 5 elements in our array, when we want to specify an element, we can actually only go to 4. I know this might be pretty confusing at first, but trust me, you will get used to it in no time. This is just one of those things that you will have to learn. Now let's create a second array, and I'll show you a different method of defining your elements. So right now we have got three integer variables with the value 0 because that's what Java initializes them to. Now if we wanted to change those values, we can use the respective index. So the integer of the index 0 gets the value 50 assigned to it, the integer of the index 1 gets the value 75 assigned to it, and the integer of the index 2 gets the value 100 assigned to it. We can of course do the same thing if we had used an array initializer list like we did up here. The only difference between the two is the way we defined their size and their values. Operating on them works the same. So at the end of this line, another array would look like this. And now we could do some fun stuff. And when we print it out, we would of course get the sum of the respective elements. Now these examples were using small sized arrays, but earlier I was talking about large programs which use arrays of far greater sizes. How would we deal with those? Well, we haven't been learning all this stuff for nothing. A really useful way of dealing with arrays is making use of the for loop. With a for loop, we have exact control on how many iterations we want and what we want to happen in every iteration. So let me give you a third example and then we will call it a day. Let's say we have an array of the size 100, and we don't want those values to start at 0, but rather a more specific value, like 500. This is how we would do it. First we create our for loop like usual. We want 100 iterations because we have a hundred elements in our array. And during every execution of this for loop, the variable i gets increased by one. So i is essentially our index variable for the array. That way, we can easily assign the value 500 to every single element of the array. We start out at zero, because remember, when using arrays, we start counting at 0 and we stop at 99, 
because the last index of our array is 99. It goes from 0 to 99, which in total makes 100 elements. Now of course we could just write 100 in here, because we know the array has a size of 100, but here's a cleaner way of doing it. Instead of hard coding the number 100 into this for loop, we use the size of the array itself as the condition. Let me show you. BigArray.length is a variable that is stored within our array, and it keeps track of how many elements are stored within. This is a better way of doing it, because now it's a variable. Let's say we want to change our program, and we want BigArray to hold a thousand values. Now we just have to change one number. If we didn't use BigArray.length, we would have to change the value in here as well. But since length is keeping track of the number of elements anyway, it does the work for us. This is a really useful and important concept later on. And of course, we could also do some crazy math or define some conditions that influence the value that we assign to the element. For instance, instead of 500, we could assign the value i. That way the first element, which is at index 0, would get the value 0. The second element, which is at index 1, would get the value 1, and so on. If you've understood this concept, you're doing pretty well. If not, don't worry about it, it is a rather confusing topic. Wrapping your head around this concept is not easy at first, and being able to use it efficiently in a real program takes time and practice. Anyway, this is all the time I have for this video. I hope you found it useful. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in the comments, and I'll be glad to help you out. If you want to see more videos like this, be sure to subscribe. See you next time!